What's up, everybody? Welcome to Shoulders of Giants, episode three. In this episode, we are interviewing Roland Kim, who is a Vancouver real estate legend. He is a father of four, a farmer, a coach, a author, an investor. The man has over 25 doors across Canada. He's a really interesting guy, and I look forward to interviewing him in this video. If you don't know the format of this video, we are gonna be asking him the 11 questions from Tim Ferriss' book. Uh, tribe of mentors that gets deep into the mind of really successful people to figure out what we can take away from them and apply to our own lives. So if you're new here, consider subscribing as it always supports my channel. If you like this video at any point, be sure to give it a thumbs up or give it a thumbs down if you don't like it because at the end of the day, it gives me feedback, which I love and it helps me create better content for you. So without further ado, let's get into this video. There we go, happening now. All right, everybody, welcome to Shoulders of Giants, episode three, where we get deep inside the minds of really successful people in their respective space. As you all know, we're all in real estate, so we're keeping it niche here. And I have today a very special guest, Roland Kim, uh, someone I've actually been uh, quite close with since the beginning of my journey into real estate. Um, so welcome, Roland. Why don't we start you. off? Why don't we just get into, um, uh, by the way, just as far as format goes today, we're going to be asking Roland the 11 questions that Tim Ferriss asks in his book, Tribe of Mentors. If you haven't read it, it's an amazing book. And these questions are designed to get really deep into the mind of, again, people who are successful. So Roland, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your background and um, kind of where you're at in business now? I know you do a lot of stuff. So um, tell us a little bit about that. Cool. Thanks, Eric. And thanks for uh, the opportunity. Um, background's pretty average, humble. Um, started uh, my life in, in Europe, and then we moved to Canada and grew up on a farm. So in Pemberton, when it was still a farming community. And um, yeah, just grew up there. I started working professionally kind of in the food and beverage world and, and became a chef and then went to hotel and restaurant school and uh, did a bit of traveling, obviously enjoyed Whistler and then I um, felt I was still missing business skills. So I did my business degree at Royal Roads in entrepreneurship, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. Did some more traveling and then moved to Vancouver, not knowing anyone and had told myself I would go outside of food and beverage for a couple of years and diversify my skills. I was involved in a couple of different smaller companies that were growing quickly and um, was going to launch a healthy fast food concept that I had designed back in the day before there were any salad bars where that uh, actually an idea came from sumo salads in Australia back in the day. Um, and uh, then the markets changed in 2008 and I mm -hmm. had already given my notice that my corporate job was about to um, focus on starting that in 2009. And then um, things changed. Couldn't do that. My investors weren't ready to put more money into that weird environment. And um, I was leaving my job and I thought I'd do part-time real estate like everyone else. You know, it's easy, it's flexible, get control of your time. And um, so- Easy. <laughs> easy, easy. And um, so I was licensed in March, 2009. Didn't know a person that was going to buy or sell. Had never focused on staying in touch with people or building a database and um, kind of just hit the ground running, trying to survive. And over those five years, in my first five years, quite aggressively grew from, I think my first year was like 18 deals to mm -hmm. um, well, 80 transactions wow. by my fifth year. And, um, and then kind of realizing, you know, at that time, taking a step back and figuring out what I want to accomplish and what's important to me. So ever since then, I've been involved in a few other companies and missions and, and things that I feel passionate about and really have gone deep since then in building a scalable, repeatable, manageable business that's built on um, repeat and referrals. So I kind nice. of get 40 to 50 transactions a year out of my database um, with like eight to 12% return. And nice. uh, I kind of try and do it with an amazing backend, really good admin, I have great support. And my on time for my real estate business is about 20 hours a week for those results. 20 hours a week. That's not bad at all. Yeah. Where do you spend the other uh, 40 hours? I have four kids um, <laughs> and um, co-own a brokerage, have lots of um, properties in, in property management. Not that I manage other people's properties, but my own. And I'm um, going more and more into investment coaching and, and other, uh, other passions of mine. Yeah. For anyone who doesn't know, Roland has a, a pretty uh, thriving group um, called Passive Canadian Real Estate and Passive American Real Estate. Is that right? 
Yeah, the American one is on the down low. We're still building out the Canadian one. So that one's really got no traction, but I want to want to make Canada proud first. There you go. And uh, you're always posting good investment opportunities for people up there. So um, I've really enjoyed that content. I'm sure a lot of people watching probably will too. Um, Cool, man. So right now you're just in summary, you're still an active agent producing pretty good volume with minimum hours. So you have a bit of a lifestyle. You're uh, co-managing a brokerage. Um, You've wrote a book um, and you're managing a, how many doors? Uh, by like April will be, I think 24. So 10 properties, 24 doors, 10 properties, 24 doors. So how do you make time for podcasts like this? Um, well, you're special, Eric. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's just, you know, it's funny, the more and like, obviously, like, you know, yourself and so many of your viewers, um, the old adage of, you know, we want something done, give it to a busy person. It's mm-hmm. um, constantly watching people that impress me. And I'm like inspired by all the balls that they're juggling. And so I'm finding better habits, better ways. You know, I'm, I'm with a quarter of the time I'm doing twice the results is mm-hmm. how to kind of frame it. And um, I'm lucky because although I do lots of things, I'm not driven by growth. Like it's not like I need to reach a certain level and I give up all my passions doing that. I'm more have a big why of taking care of my family and building something that takes care of us. And then kind of when I get to, you know, the scale in the next five to 10 years, so I'll enjoy downtime more. Nice. So you, so you seem like a pretty organized guy. We couldn't tell by the the shelves behind like you, but shelf in the, back, <laughs> the working shelf compared to your beautiful office. <laughs> like my, uh, my partner's, uh, mother's paintings. They're beautiful. Oh, I, thought they were um, yours. I had to, I had to cover some of the holes in the wall, you know? <laughs> um, cool. So let's, let's dive into this. Um, first question I want to ask is what is the book or books? And you can say your own, but if you do, you have to say another two. What are okay. the book or books you've given most as a gift and why? Or what are one to three books that have greatly influenced your life in particular? Okay. And I'm going to be jumping to my answers that I've written down because I'm not as bright as you. I can't remember everything. Um, but the one book I'm really, so thank God there's audibles because I've got like a dozen books that I periodically listen to. So I live on the North Shore Drive to East Van every day. So in the morning, um, I'm listening to audibles at least half an hour a day is my goal is at least that. And um, so I'm constantly sampling different books. And um, the one things really helped me a lot this year, just kind of refocusing, you know, you can get more done by breaking it down piece by piece. Mm -hmm. Um, Also really loving um, atomic habits these days, Mm -hmm. culture code and miracle morning and multipliers. So Mm -hmm. um, all those are ongoing. I kind of skip all around with them. And Mm -hmm. um, this year, kind of from your advice there, I've jumped into podcasts a bit more. Um, mm-hmm. I'm very slow at listening to podcasts because I like something and then I rewind it and rewind it. And, you know, it takes me forever to listen to one. Mm-hmm. But the one thing podcast is awesome. Um, I also like uh, Bigger Pockets podcast for investing in mindset. Mm-hmm. And then Think Like a CEO is um, is another podcast that. that was- yeah, I've heard some really successful people say that the more the older they got and the wiser they got, the slower they read. And I've heard a few people say that, that, you know, you'll get a lot more out of something by going through it slowly, really understanding and taking notes of it, you know, reading one book really thoroughly than say reading, you know, 10 books and just kind of reading them really quickly. Yeah. And the nice thing with Audible for me is, um, I feel like I'm pitching their product is, um, (laughs) I can listen at one and a half speed and still, um, like get, get the gist of it. Mm-hmm. And then once in a while, when there's something I want to revisit, I kind of just make notation of where it is in the, in the, in the pace of the, of the tape or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I'll go back when I'm sitting at a, at a desk and kind of take some notes from it. Um, but you kind of get through books quite quick at one and a half, way quicker than I can read. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I love audible. I've been, um, back when I worked for an agency, I was on the road for, you know, 10 plus hours a week. And that was huge. Right. Um, getting in that time in between commutes, I think is great. So, um, okay. Question number two, uh, what purchase of a hundred dollars or less has most positively impacted your life in the last six months or in recent memory? We love specifics. I'm real simple. I bought 
couple of cases of uh, one inch and two inch white binders. You don't see any behind me. This <laughs> is my working files, but I've done a really good job in the last few months of um, sectioning all the different parts of my business mm -hmm. and, and putting in binders. I'm a paper person still. Like mm -hmm. I have obviously the digital copies, but um, previous to that, I had IKEA shelves that with the little boxes everywhere and each box was a different company or a different year. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we've moved up to um, to uh, folders. To binders? To binders. It's awesome. Nice. <laughs> they only said a $100 budget. I mean, what can you get? <laughs> Not a whole lot. I think that's the idea. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we're all physical people at the end of the day. And as much as I try to try to move my life online, I still I still write all my to do's down here. Um, yeah, I mean, like what I have here too on my messy shelf is um, same thing as you. These are like probably mm -hmm. go through two a year yeah. and periodically um, I revisit them. And it's kind of, that's an interesting thing as well, where um, even in your business, whatever your business is, one of the mm -hmm. biggest lead gens that I'm discovering in the last six months and I'm, you know, trying to get other people to follow is go through your old files and books because you have so many unsecured, unfollowed up ideas, leads and opportunities that if you're a scribbler, you've written down and um, you never moved on, you never acted. And some of them you'll miss out on when you follow up. But I love going through my old um, kind of books and, and then be like, yeah, that's something I didn't get to, but still important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I think um, you kind of got to write ideas down as they come because there's so many. I think you're kind of like me and you have a lot of ideas. And then you go back and you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, Okay, cool. Qu question number three is um, how has a failure or apparent failure set you up for a later success? Do you have a uh, favorite failure of sorts? Um, I've got lots of failures. So I um, like, I don't know, something I read this year was if you're not failing, you know, close to 15%, you're probably not stretching enough. And if you're failing much more than 15% of the time, you're probably missing some skills or, or an approach. Mm -hmm. So if it comes to like sales perspective where I miss out on opportunity, I tag that in my email and, um, and periodically I go and revisit opportunities that I squandered or I didn't, I didn't secure. Mm -hmm. um, and same thing, like um, my book that I wrote a couple of years ago was kind of a result of having a journal at that time where I just document ideas and a lot of the failures led to um, better practices and what would you do, you know, to circumvent that failure. Um, so every New Year's at this time of the year, I have goals of making less failures than uh, than next year, and mm -hmm. um, and it's good because I like this year. You know, I've I've missed on a few hires of people I wanted, and we approached it the wrong way. Might have slow played it, some clients, and it's um, it's important how you approach it. But I do think reflecting on your failures is um, is valuable um, for me personally. I almost, the pain of failing is larger than the joy of succeeding. And so mm -hmm. I assume, you know, success will, will happen. And so I really need to manage kind of what I'm willing to invest into, what I'm willing to um, commit to, because I don't want a failure from it. I'm not mm -hmm. afraid of it. It's just, um, I hate failing, but <laughs> I fail all the time, at least once a month. It's necessary. Totally. <laughs> no, I like that. I think, um, I like the 15% rule. That's, that's good. I haven't heard that one before. Um, cool. So if you, uh, question four, if you had a, I love this question. <laughs> if you had a gigantic billboard anywhere yeah. in the world with anything on it, metaphorically speaking, obviously, um, getting a message out to millions or even billions, what would it say? And why could be a few words or even a paragraph. Um, disciplined activity. So for me, it's, um, I think more and more with technology in life, um, there's a lot, not even so people believe they're in a, in a mindset of getting successful quickly, but we overestimate, you know, the discipline that people are putting in and the activity that they're generating in whatever field or actions that they're taking that is leading them there. And so from the mindset of a brokerage owner, um, you know, well over hundred realtors there that you see certain people just succeeding at the highest level over a few years and other people struggling. Um, you know, the one thing often is discipline. So what is your daily schedule look like? What are you willing to commit to? And what are the activity steps that you're gonna take? Um, 
And so for me, that's, that would be great if people, you know, didn't worry about getting the next kind of success overnight and, and recognize that a lot of great things in life have been done slowly and steadily. And um, it's discipline and, and activity that leads you there. I think Tony Robbins said, um, people overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in 10. Yep. And in five years, you can entirely rebuild your life. Like I remember like simply 13 years ago, two years before I came, one and a half years before I became a realtor, I didn't qualify for a $200,000 mortgage. And now I, you know, my wife and I personally own many properties. And um, that was, luckily I didn't have like a crazy mindset back then of pie in the sky ideas. It was more, I grinded through and we worked hard and hopefully made more good decisions than bad decisions. But in five years, you can be anywhere you want to be if it's important mm-hmm. to you. Like I, think, you I like, that, I like that right there on your billboard. In five years, you could be anywhere you want to be. <laughs> I think that one's been taken a few times. <laughs> it's a little cheesy, but I, I like the message. Um, so you probably see it a lot as people, yeah, overestimating how much they can do in a short period of time. But really the fruits of our labor, just like investments is made in the long term. Yeah. What is one of the best or most worthwhile investments you've ever made? Could be an investment of time, money, energy, anything. Oh, starting our friendship, Eric. Now it's well, obviously. I shouldn't have even obviously. asked. <laughs> um, it's it, my approach in life is buy and hold, and so same as in businesses that uh, I'm part of or in real estate. Um, you know, like five years passes really quick, and five years plus in anything that you're doing, as long as you're starting from the right place is, is a buy and hold strategy. So my real estate business, I didn't have this idea initially of, of being rookie of the year and making a hundred grand, but I just assumed I I wanted to be successful and how would I get there? So, you know, every year for my first five, six years, I had a growth year. Mm -hmm. And then I did a calculated, you know, strategy of moving a different way and taking a step back as far as volume, but other opportunities came up. So, I think buy and hold is not sexy. It's boring, but it like, you know, there's two ways that the average person in, in, in this world makes money. And one is growing a great business, delivering value, maybe scaling that business with great cash flow, and hopefully selling it. Um, and the second one, which is so much easier is just freaking put 20% down on an investment property that makes sense, get it managed, forget about it, do it again in three years, do it again in three years own three investment properties in your life and 20 years down the road, you wish you did more. I've never met a person that, you know, did a buy and hold strategy and five years later regretted the decision, whether the property didn't go up in price. So I guess my mantra, it sounds like is, um, is buy and hold, like okay. give yourself five years on anything that you're doing. And um, if you want it faster than that, you got to be one creative person that's got like, you got to out hustle a lot of people where buy and hold, you can outlast them simply by just surviving. Yeah, that's a good, um, that's a good uh, metaphor. And like, I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier about the, the billboard, like people overestimate, like they always are looking for the short term gain, but reality, it's made in the long term. And I think, um, yeah, if you can get a property every three, four years, then your equity, your value and everything is going to go, I'm going to skyrocket from there, but people don't want to wait. We live in a world of wanting it now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we trick ourselves, right. We get advice from a lot of people at the, at the limelight of their career. And so, um, you know, they're talking about missed opportunities because they're taking their wins for granted. So they're like, go travel more, go do this more, go do that more. Um, because they already know they're financially, you know, successful. And of course, there's always going to be some regrets. Um, but 20 years down the road, anyone's ma- will make it sound easier than it was. Mm-hmm. And like, it's not easy, but it's not hard. It's just not easy. Mm-hmm. It's definitely not easy. It takes a lot of time. Um, but I, I think on that note, I would recommend anyone watching go to um, Roland's group, Cat- Passive Canadian Real Estate. Like I see so many great investment opportunities that you're throwing up there all the time with like critical analysis and all that kind of stuff. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah. So I mean that, um, so my business now, you know, for the past several years, real estate wise has been um, just pouring into, um, into my clients through 
giving them value. So, you know, I recognize that I'm a realtor and, and my clients are buyers and sellers point what? 2% of the time and they're homeowners the rest of the time. So how can I add value to their life around mm-hmm. the buying and selling uh, process? And um, so bulk of business comes from that. And then um, I really believe in niches. So I'm passionate about investment properties. And mm-hmm. so I've hit this niche where I'm also really believing in the fact that if I can help as many regular Canadians buy, you know, one to three investment properties, whether I'm involved in it or not, or whether I'm a catalyst for their decision, um, that's a retirement plan that no one else is going to give them. So came up with the concept of let's just throw great content out there. And uh, ideally, if there's someone in the Vancouver area that needs a realtor, I'd love to apply for the role. It, and um, equally, Vancouver is not the cheapest place on earth, and it's pretty hard to find cash flowing properties. So I'm building myself to kind of be the conduit person, the, the Canada wide investment guy. So, you know, I've got lots of contacts out there, lots of deals come my way where I put them out to my sphere and I might refer a client to a realtor in Edmonton and, you know, Saskatoon and for an opportunity, I may get a referral fee. And even if I don't, I'm just connecting, you know, two realtors and a client to move them forward on their goals. And um, I've been around long enough just to see the the connectivity that that creates. And, you know, in the end, I get a benefit some way or another. So it's just a platform and kind of, um, a passion that I want to keep growing and it's starting to get some, some legs. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, you're, you're active in there all the time. I can tell you love it. So I think, um, I'm excited to see where it goes anyway. I know I've made it once I help you buy an investment property here. There you go. <laughs> When's the bald joke coming out? I'm waiting for it. All right, so, you, so... <laughs> you, missed it. you missed it. I said at the five year mark, you can do anything you want in five years. I said, you could have a great head of hair in five years time. You're not there even you go. <laughs> it's a little too subtle that one usually usually he's a little more direct um so tell me what is an unusual question six what is an unusual habit or absurd thing that you love yeah i don't really have a good one for this but i would say what's i guess becoming more unusual is i'm using less and less of my wardrobe and i have you know at home i'm wearing a t-shirt and shorts i i dressed up with a with a semi-formal shirt for you <laughs> and at work I wear nice jeans you know dress shirt and a blazer and I've got like seven pairs of the same set of jeans because like I really don't care about clothes anymore and I <laughs> want to be on the edge of professionalism and also clothes that when my four kids jump on me I'm not worried about staining and getting dirty so I think that's kind of unique I think a lot of people waste time worrying about what they're wearing Versus I get up at a certain time, I work and then like I'm, I'm, I don't feel structured, but I'm not wasting time worrying about my hair. My hair looks the same every day and it, the, the hairline's getting shorter and shorter. And soon Mine too, man. <laughs> In five years time, you'll be like me. Evolve. Just like you always wanted. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the world's getting to a place where people are, we're kind of put in a position where we don't have to care about clothes as much anymore, do we? especially as professionals. Yeah. So, um, okay. Question seven in the past five years, what new belief behavior habit has most improved your life or your business? Um, so still a struggle. I'd say I'm at 80% of the time, but, um, probably six months ago, I started working on getting up at four 30 to four 45 in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like at night, the idea of getting up is annoying. The morning mm-hmm. up's annoying. Mm-hmm. Ten minutes into being up early, it's amazing. Like I, I love the fact that I got that hour before six o'clock, and then I become a dad at six o'clock when my kids wake up typically. Um, so that's that's a habit that's ongoing, but it's pretty close to being entrenched. Um, and um, yeah, I like that habit. Um, also tracking things, I guess. Um, both things I want to do less of, and things I want to do more of. So. If it's a habit that I need to form, um, whether it's, you know, working on fitness, working on developing a certain arm of the business is tracking it. Because I think, um, you know, same as you said, it's it's, we overanalyze or overestimate what we can get done in a year and underestimate what can happen in five years. Um, Many of us are losing so slowly that um, we think we're winning. I mean, Mm -hmm. I spent six years, you know, gaining a whole bunch of weight and 
you know, 300 calories a day that you feel like, oh, you're good, but you're on the wrong direction of fitness. Yeah. So I think it's measure, measuring, following, and um, getting up early. We all got to learn that lesson at some point, hey? Yeah. I had to learn. You I had, no you're I, slim. I, well, I had to learn when I was like 17. So okay. I, um, I, <laughs> I had to figure it out pretty quickly when I was young, but I, I saw a lot of my friends um, go through it when they turned 30. Um, yeah. It's, but it happens to everyone. And it's, you gotta be on top of it. So no, I like that. Um, you, did you read the book, the 5am club? No, no. Um, Robin Sharma. No, I haven't. Well, if you need some inspo to keep you up with that one, check that book out. Um, our, one of the groups I'm in um, with Jason, he has like an accountability group. Yeah. And they do, um, they text, they have a group where they text each other in the morning at 5 a.m. to make sure they're all up. Nice. Keep each other accountable. Nice. <clears throat> yeah, I created like a <clears throat> 90 day habit tracker. So mm -hmm. I believe that um, I think a lot of people underestimate how long it takes to really entrench that habit. So there's ideas from like day ever. My idea is like, what's the combo of um, incorporating the right number of days to create the habit in the right time frame to? <clears throat> allow for failures so mm -hmm. it's um it's 90 days of success in a 100 day window and so mm -hmm. if you can do if you can like do that i find that the habit's pretty strong nice um okay i like this one this is a good one for you what advice would you give a smart driven college student about to enter the real world and what advice should they ignore so let's flip this into a real estate context yep. what advice would you give someone who lost their job from covid getting their real estate right, license right now and about to enter the real world of real estate yeah. when it's getting even more competitive. Yeah. So <clears throat> like if I, if, if the, you know, I'd, if I'd ask you like on a scale of one to 10, like how honest do you want me to be? 10. 10. Um, so the truth is, is like, you know, the challenge with our industry is um, it's way too easy to become a realtor. And obviously a lot of people would say, well, you know, that's in your best interest because you are one. And so you don't want competition. And actually what I believe is it's unfair for a lot of the people that become realtors, not that they couldn't become realtors if it was important to them, but they approach it from the wrong mindset in the industry. There's an industry that's been created in, you know, developing realtors and, you know, the average realtor that doesn't succeed, I'm just throwing this out there. I have no measurement to it, but I would say, you know, fails out within two years and spent $15,000 in doing so 15 to 20,000. So, you know, most people that are close to getting their license or have gotten their license and, you know, they're talking to me have no idea that, you know, 80% of realtors don't make five years. It's a huge turnover. And so I would like any, thing like if i i i mean on the scale of one to ten on technology i'm a three but if i wanted to create a technology company i would ask myself am i willing to out hustle out move out maneuver out grit grind and work you know 80 percent of the marketplace and unless i really felt that why in the world would you get into this business because sure it's low barriers of entry but in doing so, it's like opening up a restaurant. There's lots of great restaurants, but again, failure rate is huge. And we don't talk about that. And so that's a real shame because I think often, you know, people deciding to be a, a realtor, perhaps a mortgage broker or a financial planner, it's not that they couldn't be great at it. They're just perhaps coming at it from the wrong approach at the wrong time of their life. And so they're destined to fail out because we've created this fallacy of, um, you know, you get control of your time, you know, it's easy money. And, uh, you know, if the neighbor could do it, you can do it. Um, and so I would really make people, you know, put their, their estimations of success low and their fear high. And that's probably something that a lot of people don't believe when they, when they think of realtors, because what you see as a realtor, when you think of the average realtor, the actions, steps that they're um, emulating that you see, that's 10% of their job. And the other 90% is the hard stuff. It's the relationship, the losing hair. You know, it's all those. <laughs> I lost mine before I got into real estate. But yeah, I, I agree. I think people see, they come into the industry with rose colored glasses and they see other realtors making multiple six figures and they think, you know, if I can do that too. And, you know, business will come to me or, you know, if I, 
there's a whole lot of fallacies. I, I agree. And I think that you're in a position to see that more than almost anyone owning a brokerage and being in the industry so long. So um, I think what you're saying is come in with the right mindset. Yeah. Come in with the right mindset and um, a good dose of fear, right? Like, yeah. you know, when I think of um, when I go to a medallion dinner and, you know, you see the top 10% there, um, perhaps, you know, 30% of those people, those realtors would be realtors that I would be attracted to personally if I was a consumer, but mm-hmm. the other 70%, including all of them, you know, they're working a system, they're running a business, they're showing up every day and treating it like a business and they're measuring it, they're following it, they're investing into it. And, you know, many people that fall into real estate see it from a different perspective. They might know one, two, three people amongst their friends, family, themselves, that is going to transact a piece of business and they do the calculation on what that commission would look like. And they automatically think that that is a good paycheck, which it is in that sense. But if you can't build a business from those opportunities, you know, you haven't done anything yet. And it becomes a very humbling business very quickly because um, very few people in this world, especially in Vancouver, are at a lack of knowing realtors. Like every one of my friends knows 10 realtors and six of them are amazing. So. I got to fight really hard if I get a chance at representing. 10 realtors and six are amazing. Um, oh, maybe. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what advice should they ignore then? Anything specific that you hear? Yeah. A lot? Like the, the idea of having uh, flexibility and like okay. any realtor that's out there, that's sparking away about um, having control of their life and flexibility and the money's great. Um, they've either worked really hard in building a business and a model that's allowed them to do that or they may be at the limelight of their career where it's great like they are they're they're in mexico right now they're chilling even though we got COVID, they're there for half the year um but their business is receding but it's fine because they're you know they're going to scale it out and 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 retire on it but the average realtor that's that's promoting that mindset you know i'd really figure out if they have a business that you want because um it's not what I see. I see a lot of hardworking people that are delivering amazing value to clients that are, you know, realtors that I really respect. And many of them, one of their big, you know, objectives every year is getting more balance into the life, is pouring more energy into their family, is um, taking back some control, is reducing expenses. It's, you know, it's the rarity is the person that has full flexibility on time and doesn't need to work for the business. Mm-hmm. That's, I think, the biggest crux of a realtor is you're really at the mercy of your clients, especially in the beginning when you don't have any systems. You're almost more of a slave to the the time than than anything. Yeah, and every realtor is going to have to figure out what their boundaries are, you know, and and um, each boundary has a limitation and and uh, has a has a reaction. So. Mm-hmm. It- been quite a few years before I had kids and I had a very accommodating supportive um, wife that let me you know sabotage a lot of our time and pretty much worked seven days a, a week for years and mm-hmm. um, and now I don't work you know most of Friday all of Saturday and there's a way of doing that but mm-hmm. I had to get um, and I still you know probably invade our personal family time a bit um, mm-hmm but that's not easy to get there, right? Like that's, that's a business. You're running a business. Yeah. It takes years to get there for most people, I think. So um, I think we kind of uh, covered number nine, which is, are there any bad recommendations you hear in your profession um, or area of expertise? We talk about what advice um, they should ignore. Anything to add to that? Yeah, not really. Just, um, you know, I would um, maybe if you want to become a realtor, try and find five realtors that failed out, whether they chose to exit or whether they got exited, but um, and find out what, you know, what what was different than what their expectations were, because um, I often sit down with a new recruit and um, a new person that's gung ho passionate about, you know, their perception of the business. Mm-hmm. And what they perceive is the 10% that we talked about that you see a realtor doing, which is the HGTV portion. And 90%, that's the scary, daunting, painful, hard, rewarding part is a question on, are you going to do it? Will you do it? 
And if you don't do it, the outcome is guaranteed and it's not the one you want. Yeah. I think, um, I've seen this with a lot of people in a lot of industries is they, they work up an idea in their head about what something's like and decide then and there, if that's something they want to pursue. But I think the better option is what you just said, which is go do your research, go ask to sit down for a coffee with someone, you know, go ask to, um, get in the car and do a ride along of sorts in, in an industry. If you can take a day and go figure out what it's actually like boots on the ground, because it's probably not what you expect. You know, it's like people that go to university thinking they're going to want to do one thing and they go and they take a random class and something else. And they're like, wow, I actually hate the thing I thought I liked. And I like the thing I didn't think I liked. And I think the same applies for not just real estate, but almost any industry. So that's, that's really good advice. Um, <clears throat> So I, and I, I see that especially because there's so many people getting licensed right now. Are you seeing yeah. that as well? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it always feels the case, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, but I feel like 300 come in and 300 leave every month or whatever the number is. So, mm -hmm. um, 11 years in, I mean, we're, we're not going to have a medallion dinner this year in February, but, uh, for the previous years, you know, majority 80 percent are the same people every year and you get some people working their way up and some people that are slowly working their way down but um for all you know for the thousands of new realtors that join our board it's uh it's very difficult to get in the top 10 20 percent mm -hmm. but it's so easy that's the thing right like it's the e easiest business if you just follow some steps but your human nature doesn't want to do the work half the time yeah. So getting mentorship is huge. And being honest with yourself, right? Like there's no need to be a realtor unless you're going to be a good realtor. There's, um, you know, there's lots of ways of making minimal wage. Real estate doesn't have to be one of them. The part-time realtor doesn't always, doesn't always work out too well, does it? Yeah. But some like, you know, like I had the intention of being part-time and I just it got overwhelmed by the fact that I felt it was uh, totally filling my entrepreneurial cup and, you know, the, the part-time went out the window quite quickly. Mm -hmm. There are a few realtors that do part-time successfully, but part-time is like, it's one of their three businesses. So they run it like a business versus the people that, you know, only show up when a client calls them. Mm -hmm. That's a dangerous model. So building on that, um, which is question 10, um, in the last five years, what have you become better at saying no to specifically distractions, invitations, all that kind of stuff. Um, what new realizations or approaches helped in saying no to things? Yeah. So I'm doing a really, really good job this year. Of, I'm not going to parties, not traveling, <laughs> focusing on my work. And um, so that's, that's been great. COVID's been helpful for that. Um, seriously though, it's, um, it's the recognition that like you got a finite amount of time and, you know, as you migrate through life, whether you have a family or don't have a family, certain things will become important to you. And so I never thought I'd have kids, let alone four kids. And yet I'd give everything up work-wise in a heartbeat just to hang out with them if that was a decision I had to make. And so for me, it's recognizing, like if I wanted to take it to the micro level, is uh, you know getting an opportunity to work with a potential client that I would have jumped at 10 years ago. And I look at that client and nothing against them, but I'm like, I don't want to show you 40 properties. It no longer fits in my style, my model, or my interest. And so I'm going to find you a great realtor that would love that opportunity, but I'm not going to compromise. You know, I'm going to be real, be honest, and recognize the fact that the decision I make, whether I choose to hire or choose to uh, work for you, um, will have a con consequence in my personal life and my family life. And, you know, so it, the short answer for the, what you asked is um, being aware of the consequence of every action you take. You're not always going to fully comprehend what happens, but um, that is that is a reality. And another big reality in, in real estate is um, getting control of your emotions. I've seen way too many realtors as a brokerage owner uh, get deep, deep into their position, right, of um, why they feel they're right what happened to them, why it should go in a different direction. And often they're arguing something to a detriment that 
one, you know, in, in one circumstance, the, the moment has passed. It no longer is relevant. And secondly, it's affecting their future, right? And so the passion, the emotions, they're, it's getting away from them. It's actually becoming negative. And so the realtor that's able to be con in control of their emotions, the professional that's able to control their emotions, the professional that's able to foresee what will happen if I make a strategic decision, um, that's powerful. That doesn't mean you might not make a decision that's going to cause you some pain, but you're making that decision versus being reactive, right? Like the decision of not paying the taxes to the government, that's got a reaction. But, you know, if your family's held hostage and you need the money for solving that, obviously it's a better decision than giving the money to the government. Just be aware of what the consequences. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, try and keep the fires at bay and don't pick battles that you don't need to fight. Yeah, that's good advice. And it's nice that you're in a position to do that. I think um, a lot of realtors, when they get into the business, have that kind of energy of, you know, commission breath or des you know, um, desperate for a deal. And they will just kind of say yes to everything. And then they get burnt out really quickly, as I'm sure you've seen. Yeah. And I mean, early on, one of my lucky steps of success was I was always amazed that people would choose to let me drive them around in the car and and work for them. So I worked with probably, you know, 12 years ago, 11 years ago with 10 buyers and three of them would close. And two of those people that closed would say, I never actually thought I'd buy a property. I just thought we were going on tours. <laughs> so I out hustled them at the same time my model has changed now because I've been, you know, calculating in what I want. And, um, and so there's better realtors to serve that client. And equally there's clients out there that want a very powerful, educated, you know, realtor that's going to understand what the client needs and show them six properties and get the deal done. And mm -hmm. so there's, there's a realtor for every client. I'm not for everyone. <laughs> well, you're definitely for me, man. I'll give you that one. <laughs> so um, last question, when you yeah. feel overwhelmed or unfocused or have lost your focus temporarily, what yeah. do you do? Yeah. What do you do? Um, so for me, it's real simple. It's, um, you know, every day I go to bed, I think of, uh, I tell myself, I actually write it down in, in a day planner, but I document one or two things I'm appreciative for. Yesterday it was, um, I got to take my car back from the shop and, when it was getting winter tires on it and um, it needed new brakes and it needed some other stuff. And I paid a bill for $3,000 and I was appreciative of like, how lucky am I that $3,000 doesn't like throw me into chaos. Right. Mm -hmm. like, obviously I didn't enjoy paying it, but how lucky am I that I was able to pay that bill and, and not um, break down over it because it was unexpected. And so um I have a sticker actually on one of my vision boards where it's um, a lot of stuff that you and I, you know, fret over and worry about and, 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 and are frustrated about are literally the dreams that 80% of the world is aiming for, right? Like that car that had a flat tire and you can't figure out why the shop keeps not fixing it. And yet you have like a freaking $50,000 car that you get to drive around. So for mm -hmm. me, it's real simple. It's I, I think I've done well. I'm going to continue to work at the same time. I'm very confident and positive that, you know, thousands of people, if they were in my same position with the same opportunities and challenges would have done so much more in life and equally many people would have done less. So it really, for me, calms it down and, and says, you know, I often don't get flustered, but if I, if I got confused and exhausted, I would just bring it back to what's important to me and, you know, if I needed to give some things up, what, what would I give up? Um, mm -hmm. And be appreciative. Like, sadly, we're in a world of um, more is more. And maybe COVID is changing that into the future. I'm seeing some glimmers of hope. I did start a, uh, like a community group that's moving into a nonprofit called Ridgeline Rangers, where it's a really simple concept. I want to teach as many young people and old people as I can to take more garbage out than they bring into the world in, in the environment. And um, like that fills my cup where it's um, appreciate what you have and make small steps to kind of improve the environment around you. And by doing that, you probably calm down if you're over, over stimulated. Yeah. So gratitude. If gratitude I had met you eight years ago, it would have saved your hair. 
<laughs> my hair was already gone eight years ago. Dude, were you like a bald baby? Pretty much. I I started I started shaving my head or trimming my head at uh, 21. Okay. So I, I did yeah, notice that. I didn't quick. mention, but like your hair, like you you shined up the head today. It looked sparkly. I like just a, just a quick shave, you know. No, I love that. Um, I think gratitude journaling is yeah really important. And at the end of the day, we're all just particles floating through space, right? Yeah. <laughs> so who cares? <laughs> All right, Roland. Well, um, how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn about investing, any other opportunities that you have? Yeah. Um, just Google my name and there's lots of different handles. You can find me on Facebook quite easily. Otherwise, my number is 604-970-0393. And um, yeah, like uh, if you just no strings attached, if you want to talk for a few minutes over anything, I'd love to um, have that time. And um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Eric. I, I can vouch she's uh, Roland's a pretty approachable guy. So anyway, man, I, I really appreciate you coming on. I, I hope everyone got some uh, wisdom that you shared with us today. Um, so I really appreciate it. And yeah, if you guys want to check out Roland's investment group, I'd highly recommend it. Um, follow the guy. He's up to a lot of interesting stuff. So I um, really appreciate you coming on, man. Um, I'll be putting this up on YouTube and I'll let you know when I, I get that all ready to go. But otherwise, I'm sure I'll talk to you before then. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Thank Take you. care. Bye-bye. All right, everyone, that wraps up today's video. I really hope you got what you wanted out of it. As always, smash that subscribe button so you don't miss any content when I drop it. Hit that like button if you like this video. Hit the dislike button if you didn't. If you want to reach out to myself or Roland, leave a comment below or you can find us on Facebook. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to leave you with a couple more videos here you can check out and I will see you all in the next one.